Ever wonder how to nail the tight end position in best ball? Today, we've got the tight end guru himself, Andrew Cooper, to spill all the secrets. Let's dive in. Yo, what's up, everybody? We're back with another episode of Too Much Best Ball. I am your host, Brian, and today we have a very special guest joining us. He is a fantasy football mastermind, the tight end whisperer, a key contributor at Fantasy Alarm. You might also know him from the Sirius XM Fantasy Sports Radio. Give it up for Andrew Cooper, also known as Coop A Fiasco. Welcome in, man. Dude, that intro is electric with the music, <laughs> man. I feel like Michael Jordan coming out. Woo, let's go. Yeah. Well, we got to keep it just quiet enough so YouTube doesn't hear it on the uh, the monetization there. Yes. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we got to have a little bit of fun bringing, it, bringing you in, man. I go well, quick, quick story on that topic. I'll tell you, don't ever play uh, Tub Thumper by Chumbawamba because they will come after you. They actually no got kidding. our YouTube channel shut down for two weeks. Yeah, they, when you only have one song, you got to be very protective of that song. One hundred percent. There's one hit that wonders. One, absolutely. Dude, they they <laughs> got. I, I if I remember correctly, our YouTube and Twitter accounts got shut down. Like the house Twitter account got shut down for like two weeks because they were just like they're they're monetizing our song and they just you know yeah. So be careful with Jumbawamba. Well, hell, if there's any example of getting knocked down and getting back up again, it's right here. <laughs> yeah, it takes you two weeks to get back up again, based on my experience. Yeah. Oh, man. Well, I'm uh, super pumped here. Of course, this is too much best ball, and we're, we have to dive into tight ends. Uh, it's one of my favorite positions just because it's annoying as hell. It's one of the dumbest positions outside of, what, a handful of players, maybe half a dozen. But it gives you something to grind. It really gives you... I don't know, there's 10, 15 guys that you can argue and nobody can really tell you no. They can argue against it, but there's so much up in the air. There's so much BS that goes left and right. So uh, I'm really excited to dive into that. Before we do, though, for the handful of people that might not know who you are, we've got to go through a, a handful of questions. Get to know who is Andrew Cooper. Um, so it comes to a pizza, pineapple. Are you yay or are you nay? Wow, you're coming with the, the heavy hitting question. This is a hard oh, yeah. question. And I'll tell you yeah. what. Uh, Established am, credibility right here. <laughs> I'm someone, all right? I'm someone who believes that there's a time and place for every topic, which includes pineapple, which includes pineapple. For me, like, I get real into the pizza where it's like with, with local places, I got to know if it's like those pepperonis, like the cupped ones that curl when you cook. You know mm. what I mean? Like bar pizza, I'll go pepperoni. My local place that I like best, man, I'll just go cheese because the pizza is that good. I don't want to put anything else on it. You know what I mean? But I'm I'm on board with pineapple on on pizza. And I think the big thing that we should all take away is this. Even if you don't like it, I think you should respect the uh, ability to choose for everybody else out there. Because he's not, he's Absolutely. Not this is a freedom to choose podcast here. That's you choose right. your topping. Yeah. Respect <laughs> the beliefs of others is where I'm at with, with pineapple on pizza. 100%. I'm not a big pineapple guy, but I, I do, like you said, time and a place. I, I get where it kind of lines up there with that Canadian bacon, that little salty, that's sweet. And like you said, I, I don't think there's many toppings I wouldn't allow on a pizza if you make it right. Right. So open-minded pizza people here. That's what you're getting at too much best ball. Exactly. Yeah, this is a, yeah, we're pe people pleasers with pizza and pineapple. A lot of peas going on. I love the alliteration, man. Let's keep it rolling. <laughs> Let's keep it rocking. Dude. Uh, second one I've got for you, Die Hard. Is it a Christmas movie? We, we were talking a little bit about movies beforehand because I do have the, the movie podcast. But when it comes to December, can I bring this up when it comes to Christmas categories? Very divisive questions here. I, I think the answer, so I've done a lot of thinking on this one. I've gone back and forth, right? I've done the argument. So the biggest argument is whether or not you can remove Christmas from the plot and still have them, which, you know, I've gone back and forth on that. People say, oh, it could be Thanksgiving, right? But who's really traveling across country for Thanksgiving? I mean, no now you're stretching it. But I think the big thing for me is that when you look at the soundtrack for this movie, there's quite a bit of Christmas movie, Christmas music. And I think if you remove a number of those tracks, it kind of, it, it kind of, I don't know what you could replace them with. Like when to strip the Christmas out of the movie, it, it, it takes too much out of the movie. So I think it's great. I think for me, it falls under Christmas. The hard part is that when you say it's a Christmas movie, now you got to start asking whether it's the best Christmas movie of all time. Because it's such a good movie. It's such a good movie that, and you look at the other Christmas movies, it kind of blows them out of the water, right? Like, we both agree, before I get your take on it, we both agree it's a great movie, right? 100%. Great movie. I I'm right there with you. It is a Christmas movie to me. It is. One of okay. the best. That's where it's hard for me. Because the, the thing is, like, 
I wouldn't t- when you take like obviously there are great Christmas movies, but when I'm making my list of all time best movies, I don't know where I would put like like Home Alone's not gonna make the list of all time great movies, but Die Hard is top one hundred maybe. I mean like. Yeah, I think that's where I would split the hairs a little bit. I would have two different lists. I don't think it would be top five for me as Christmas movies, but I do think it would be in my top all-time movies list. So, so when you're sense. making, you know what, it does make sense because when you when you're making your like it's like best ball versus redraft, right? Mm-hmm. Two different yeah. lists. One of them skews more towards certain things. So, you with your Christmas movie list, the Christmas factor is a is a heavy uh, heavy scale, and on a scale of one to ten. Die Hard in terms of Christmas is we I think we can all agree one or two at that right for sure but I, I, Santa's, it's just not, Santa's not even in it Santa's not <laughs> right in it. You know I mean? so like you can't even get it can't even be a five right like there's there's some movies that are strict Christmas 10, 10 you know what I mean for sure Nightmare Before Christmas another one that at best three I'm not a Tim Burton not, guy so I'm not I'm bad to ask on that well I like the movie it's just there's not a whole lot of Christmas there's a lot of there's a lot of Halloween there's even a little Thanksgiving but. We, we're getting a little too off the path here. Uh, right. A Die Hard, <laughs> yes, it is a Christmas. I love it. I, I love it. Uh, even though this all it, it's opinion based right here, and we, but there is right and wrong answers. I'm just gonna let you know there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. People shutting it off because they're like, no, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's a fun, it's a fun debate. Hundred uh, percent. So, last one we, I have to know: uh, fantasy football pet beeves. Do you have any? What's your What's your biggest one? Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, and this one more applies to social media. Uh, there are certain terms that people will use that do drive me nuts. You know, like when they say, and it's not even close. There's one specifically that drives me insane. And that's, and uh, yeah, if I mentioned this on the show, people will probably be tagging me on Twitter and responding to my tweets with it, but whatever. Uh, when people say, have you watched him play? Or it, it, they start their argument with, if you watched him play, then you would know, blah, blah, blah. So if I say like, oh, you know, I don't think – I think Cole Komet, you know, is, could have trouble getting targets this year with uh, the other tight ends there. And then, you know, they got Roma Dunze and Keenan Allen and DJ Moore. And then somebody comes in and says, well, I'm a Bears fan. If you watched him play, then you would know. That drives me nuts because it, it, it's them implying that I don't watch football, which couldn't be further from the truth. It's implying that they have somehow watched more Cole Komet than me, right, and that they they, they don't even explain what it is that they've seen. Like – you're not actually saying anything. You're, you're, yeah. you, you say if you watched him play, you would see how good he is in the red area, you know, when everyone's on zero coverage. That's fine. But they end it with if you watched him play, then you would know. And that drives me bonkers, dude. I can't handle it. It's like the people thinking the, oh, you don't know ball is an exclamation ball. point on a conversation. It's, it's like, the same thing. elaborate. Right. What do you mean? <laughs> right. like, you didn't watch the games. It's like, no, what do you think? I'm just throwing things out there. You think that I would, I'm going to turn around and say, you know what? I, I'll, I'm going to actually watch Cole Komet because I've never watched him. And then I'll come back and be like, dude, I just watched Cole Komet. You're totally right. <laughs> like, dude, that's never, ever, ever happened in the history of the internet. So stop saying it to me on Twitter. Stop saying it to me on Reddit. I can't agree more. Uh, it's as you say it, like now I, I'm just picturing it in my head, all the scrolling I've done. Oh yeah, that's right. It's in like every freaking thread. I, it's oh, always geez. a guy with the bears handle. It's like, you know, the bears chief four twenties is handle and it's all bears pictures and just things. And he's like, if you watched him play, because me, a Bears super mega fan, of course, my unbiased take is that I have watched every game that Cole Komet has played. And I think he's good. Like, okay, thank you. Thank you. Bears chief super fan. 25. 25. <laughs> I changed his handle. I forgot the original handle. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you know, if I had to say I have one, I don't know why, but it's developed a lot over the last few years. We're a people. We're a society. We're looking to change, looking to adapt. We do things differently than we ever have. Why is it still standard half PPR and PPR? Why can't it be standard half PPR and non PPR? The fact that we still treat non PPR as the standard, right. maybe it's just the verbiage. We need to change it to something different. But I hate that. That's the way we look at it. You know, a standard half and then full PPR. No PPR or even half should be the standard. You know, it's just it bugs the I'll crap tell, out of me. I'll tell you, there uh, people nowadays can't even imagine because I've been playing for twenty years. They can't even imagine the pushback that when PPR was invented. That's why 100%. it's like standard in PPR because PPR was like this 
evil thing for a bit. And it like, there are still people. I mean, there are arguments to be made that, you know, when you, uh, Ian Harditz always does the, uh, the two plays Have you ever seen him do the, uh, the both, he'll say both these plays are worth, uh, are worth oh, three yeah. points in PPR. And then it's one play where it's like a running back bowling people over and spinning and he gets, you know, 30 yards. Right. And then the next play is like a screen pass where the guy just runs and falls right down. And he's like, both these plays are worth three points. In PPR. Yeah. That's where I'm fully half PPR team. Just because when you see Ryan Shazier catch a zero yard pass, that should not be one point, you know, like give him the half right. point. Sure. Give him some credit, but don't be loading up yeah. these guys behind and, the line of scrimmage. With and if you point. like half PPR, that's probably when people should go over to underdog and use promo code FF advice. Probably right. Bam! Look at that! I oh, love it. Oh, that's my <laughs> job, but you pull in. Ah, oh, look at that! I absolutely love it. Professional. <laughs> Best in the biz, folks. That's why we bring him on. If I can't do it, I'll find somebody okay. who can. Uh, minus my boss. Don't be. Don't listen to that. Part. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. Your job is safe, brother. I'm just a guest here. I got my own gig right here. With the 100 percent over there at fantasy alarm make sure we are checking out that and of course i did l- read that new chris godwin article you just dropped recently over there i love it big chris i got, a, godwin I got another myself. one dropping today that you're really gonna like because it the title of the article is called how to navigate the tight end position in best ball <laughs> that's that's what we're talking about <laughs> today well yeah. let's go ahead and transition that over to let's talk about our best ball approach here uh before we jump in fully into the tight end how strict or how loose are you when it comes to your strategy? Um, you know, we, we know about roster construction, how to build rosters within a certain limit, um, having four to five wide receivers by round seven, different rules that we, we see popping up all over. Um, are, are you willing to be fluid? Are you willing to float and kind of do whatever? Um, so it's actually at the beginning of the draft, I am incredibly fluid, like water, best available, bing, bang, boom. And at the end, I do tighten it up, as you talk about with the roster constructions, because we know, right, that the advance rates for you know teams you want to be within a certain window right especially if you uh you know like obviously if you only have one qb or one tight end you need a second one right so like with that i've put it this way i've never one time drafted a team that only had one quarterback or one tight end so in that regard i do have strict rules that i abide by right i will every once in a while draft four tight ends very rarely you're supposed to draft two or three based on the numbers right same with quarterback two or three i don't really ever draft four uh quarterbacks but everyone's because you know teams do advance with four and i've won best ball leagues with four you know i've i've, I've done a lot of different things so uh you got to uh you got to I, I i prefer to just do best available whenever possible and it's nice when it all lines up but you do have to have rules there are rules like, uh, what's that? The Big Lebowski? This isn't Nam, Donnie. Right. There There's rules. freaking rules here. <laughs> There's rules here. Oh, man. Big Lebowski. Yeah. That's going to be one of the next movies we have to do. On I know you're a movie guy. Yeah. Market 8, <laughs> dude. <laughs> Um, well, I guess that kind of covers some of my, my second question for you there. Just wanting to know, is there anything that you don't ever do or rarely do? I, I guess, you know, as you said, rarely go into the, to four on the onesie positions uh, at the yeah. quarterback or tight end. So yeah, I rarely, I rarely do that. I guess I would also say um, I rarely reach for uh, what I what I like to consider tiebreakers. And this is this I would say this may be potentially controversial. That when I look at stacking and I look at schedule, I consider those to be tiebreakers. Where I'm not going to if there's two players sitting there and I really truly don't have a strong lead in one way or other the other i will consider week 16 and 17 correlation you know in tournaments where there's playoffs i will consider whether i have the quarterback for that guy already right but only as a tiebreaker because even the stack master josh josh larkey uh kind of proved that you lose a lot of value once you reach above and beyond uh you know to to get those i'd rather the stacks if you're going to win the stacks will fall in order and you'll actually get them after the value, right? Like that's the best when you complete a stack uh, and you get both guys below ADP. When you start reaching above ADP just to complete a stack or just to, you know, stack up a matchup for week 16 or 17, I feel like you're losing too much value. Again, controversial, but I rarely, if I rarely ever sit there and say to myself, man, I'm going to, since I already drafted Cortland Sutton, I'm going to reach and grab Bo Nix. Like it's just not something I'm doing. Yeah, hard pass there. <laughs> I picked a very. I picked that. I yeah. I cheated by picking that combo. You know what I mean? But, 
Hey, it's uh, it's not a combo I've been going away from completely. Again, not reaching on that, but if you're looking for late round correlation, there Denver's one that's it's kind of you know that and the Patriots have been a couple teams that I've been looking at late in drafts. Patriots are tough. Patriots, are, the Patriots, because you know I just talked about, talked about Week 17. I did obviously look at the schedule. Do you know their Week 17 matchup? It's a it's we're set to be a real barn burner, Brian. Yeah, it's, it's I can't remember off the top of my head now. Uh, Greg Roman and uh and Jim Harbaugh and their punch you in the face ground and pound offense they're going up to uh New England in December for week 17 so i mean if it snows for that game the over under for that game might be like 12 no kidding right yes. <laughs> that's not going to be that one doesn't scream huge point totals but again you never you never know you never know uh, yeah at the same time with the uh, with the possibility of snow you know shenanigans always happen that kind of situation, especially Sean, Mc- Sean McCoy was the king of the snow, dude. He oh was, man, he unstoppable whenever it snowed. I don't know what it, he's special cleats or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was up at the uh, actually the the Colts Bills game several years ago, the the Blizzard Bowl or whatever up there when it oh. was like we were going through like a foot of snow and they're running through there. Oh, Sean McCoy killed us. Unbelievable, uh, yeah. He, he, I don't know what it was. Him and Tom Brady. Tom Brady turned into a machine in the snow, but like most guys, you know, it most most. Folks have a hard time with that, especially if you're yeah, coming that, from Los Angeles. Yeah, that's this guy. I, I live right here by the beach. It's, you know, once it gets down to like 50, I'm like, all right, let's bundle up. This is not cool anymore. Yeah. <laughs> we're off where I live. It's like you, you know, we're so used to it. We just turn the air conditioning on in the summer and, and wear a sweatshirt around the house, you know, and try and never that's go it. outside. <laughs> that's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I guess as far as your approach going into drafts, do you have a favorite approach? Do you usually look for, a uh, like an early tight end or an order early quarterback or are you heavy into those running back wide receivers so i love it when because i'm contractually obligated to find try and find late round tight ends for people and breakout tight ends i love it when the value is there at other positions early uh and i can utilize that skill right like that's my number one advice to people is lean into what you are best at what you enjoy if possible right if you can reverse, if you like, re- think you're really good at finding late QBs or late wide receivers or running backs, uh, and this especially goes for redraft, but best ball as well, uh, lean into that, right? Like I have a buddy who's so good at finding breakout wide receivers, but then he also will sometimes draft, start his draft zero RB, and he'll start his draft drafting six wide receivers, and then, and then you know, and then he'll add all these wide receivers off the bench, and then now he's got like, like he he had Puka Nakua. But he also had a bunch of wide receivers, and then his running backs and tight ends and quarterbacks were terrible. And he usually takes a bullet train to third place. Like I, I, I hope he never figures it out because then he would start winning more often. But lean into what you're good at. So for me, I love when uh, I can load up at other positions and utilize that light tight end info. But in best ball, you got to draft two or three anyway. So I just if I if I get one early, then I wait and I still take some of those sleepers. I do I do like to wait on tight ends. Yeah, that's typically been my approach too. I like searching, you know, combing for those guys. Um, you know, the those later tight ends that you can get stack, you know, like you said, grab them really late. But right now, this year's been the hardest for me because the amount of tight ends that are falling, the early tight ends, because I don't, I hate the middling round. Uh, you know, in years past, I know David Njoku did good last year, but typically taking him in those middle rounds with like the Goddards and the Trey Burton when he was going, you know, just those guys that, they're not elites. You're not taking paying a high level for them, but you should just be waiting three or four rounds. So I, I'm typically not an early guy, but I love the value that's falling right now this year. Right. You know, Travis Kelsey, nowhere near the top. It's crazy. You know, I, honestly, because I love Sam Laporta, it kind of stinks that I'm not really drafting much Sam Laporta just because the other, just there's so many values, so many great values. Yeah, and that goes for the top and the, the bottom of drafts. I think that there's values across the board right now, which is great. When we get to redraft season, I think that it's there's going to be so much information out there that it's not going to be as easy as we thought. Right, but right now, I feel I just feel so good about the position. I get that. I get that. Yeah. Uh, you bring up redraft. Do you find yourself uh, your your tendencies in redraft? Does does that skew your ability to kind of really? take down a draft in best ball. Uh, I I guess just like an example, I'm really running back heavy, especially in my home league. So it hurts me in best ball to have to like sway against what I naturally work with. Yeah. I think nowadays what's happening is actually it's working the opposite where 
best ball is becoming so prevalent for a while. It was like this niche game that like we played on like other sites that before underdog came around and kind of perfected it. Like, you know, there were other sites out there that were like the MySpace of best ball that were doing it for a while. And then obviously, you know, the, the powerhouse came by and really crushed it with underdog. Uh, but uh, nowadays I feel like best ball is kind of messing up redraft ADP where now, you know, running backs are easier than ever to get. And that's kind of, in redraft and in hometown leagues, those those can often be the league winners. So I kind of love that. But yeah, for me, I do, uh, I am cognizant of those mistakes, and I actually see people making those mistakes. We'll do drafts with like members and stuff like that, and and people and they'll ask me after, and I try not to hurt people's feelings. But I just had somebody in our Discord the other day post a draft and say, "What do you think about this?" And uh, I could tell that they handcuffed both their running backs like on purpose, and they even mentioned that, and I was like, "That's actually." in this particular format, maybe not the best strategy, right? They, that's kind of an old, older school. It was an older school player and an older school strategy, obviously. So like, you gotta be careful, like not a bad move in those formats, but in this format, you know, not, not, doesn't give you the most upside, right? Yeah. And it's, it's wild how we see that, you know, just talking to more of my casual friends that play or even like my dad, like, like you said, some of those older strategies, he's been, Oh no, this is what works. This is what always works. I'm like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Like he he gave me a hard time a few years ago when I was talking about JD McKissick to him. He goes, "Oh, there's no way he's gonna do anything." I was like, "But he catches enough balls that like you know." I'm like, I'm not saying he's gonna be a top three guy, but I was like, he's gonna be more relevant than the guy you're throwing out here. So, and, and the reason that is is because when I first started playing, that strategy did work. It was an incredible mm-hmm. strategy. Like, yeah, Priest Holmes one year had 400 touches, and his backup Larry Johnson had 20, 20. Right. And then Priest Holmes got hurt and Larry Johnson the next year had like 365 touches. Right. It's it used to be the case where there were these just plug and play one for one replacements. Now it's more of a route. So the game has yeah. changed. And if you haven't adapt, if you haven't evolved, then your mindset still would be that I need to get the handcuff for my star because then I'm set. You know what I mean? Which very rarely is the case these days. Yeah, the amount of handcuffs that hit waiver wires between between like week three and week six, it's wild. Just like, yep, right. wasted pick right there. It's silly. And our inability to guess who's going to get hurt, the inability to guess who can even step in and be good, the inability to guess when they're going to turn it into a split backfield if the, if the top dog gets hurt versus whether one guy is going to get the job, the inability to even figure out which guy is going to be the guy, right? Like, is like we've seen that with like the Colts. Like, I don't think a lot last year, not everybody had Zach Moss pegged as like the guy. There was a debate there, and then he ended up being very good. But it's like you know, it's just so hard. It just it, to me, it's not worth the bench spots. I'd rather just drop the fab if, if an injury happens. And that might even be a huge addition to that change as well. Now that fab is becoming the new norm within leagues right. versus you know just the waiver wire. Um, I, I think fab changes the league's play 100% during the regular season. Like just what you're able to do, how unfair it can be at the beginning of the season, the waiver wire. So, um, yeah, I, I think we've got tons of evolutions coming to not only the NFL, but also, you know, fantasy. There's a very specific tight end that I think benefits greatly from fab that we're going to, I imagine, I don't want to give any away, but we're going to talk about today. Well, <laughs> let's dive into that uh, right now then. Let's talk about our tight ends because that's, you can't necessarily lose because of your tight end selection in best ball, but I think you can definitely win based on your tight end selections. You know, if, if you grab the right combination of elite and then clean up or, you know, enough middling guys, I've seen a little bit about your yin and yang uh, position, the way you go with tight ends. So um, break down a little bit for me, your, your early tight ends. What, which ones are you really looking at right now? Yeah. So for the yin and yang, anyone not familiar, that's a redraft strategy. And the idea is you draft, you wait on the position, you draft somebody that you can trust the first couple of weeks to just be in your lineup and you feel okay about it. They don't have to be, you know, a lot of times they can be the boring guys like Dallas Goddard and, and folks like that. Uh, and then you use a second pick on the highest risk, highest upside guy possible, right? And people will sometimes say, oh, why don't you just draft high risk guys? Well, with a lot of those guys, you can't start them right away. Like the best example would be Trey McBride last year. You couldn't start Trey McBride until like week five because Zach Ertz was the star, right? Like mm-hmm. you couldn't start, like no one was drafting in his breakout year, Mark Andrews and just plugging him right in. But if you did yin and yang, you got that guy before waivers. So that's kind of the play there. In best ball, uh, things, it, it changes both uh, what what we go after 
and it also changes the the types of players that we can we can draft right at the top of the draft i'm always going to go after the same thing which is guys that i believe are locked in as the top two target on their team that's it last year every tight end one in pr was a top two target on it was either first or second and i say top two brian because you don't have to be number one in fact the number one all-time fantasy football season was by Rob Gronkowski when he got 124 targets and Wes Welker got 174. All you have to be, you don't have to be number one on the team. You just have to be in that top two, right? And then with the third guy, targets start to fall off. And that's where we get hurt. But uh, so I'm looking for these guys that are locked in, which has me gravitating towards whoever I can get the best price on out of the top five or six guys, right? So uh, for me, uh, the number one guy that I go for is Mark Andrews, but I know you're a big Mark Andrews fan. So I'll let you talk about him. Uh, I also am going for this year, Kyle Pitts. Kyle Pitts has not only the, the most important thing, which is being a top two target on the team. It's him and Drake London. I don't expect Darno Mooney to come in and command a ton of targets. And now they have the quarterback with Kirk cousins. He had, he's a top two target and he has all the ancillary pieces that we like to see from, from a elite tight ends, right? He's good versus man to man. He has incredible athleticism, which allows him to have more breakaway plays, right? There's a, there's a reason that George Kittle has 16, 40 plus yard plays and Kelsey has 14 and nobody else has more than seven over the last like seven years. It's because of his speed, right? Like you look at Tyler Conklin caught 61 passes last year and had like 600 yards. Uh, George Kittle caught 65 and he had over a thousand. That's the difference is that George Kittle is this like unicorn freak, right? Uh, but Kyle Pitts is that, and he's also, you know, it's going to be him in London, I think, at the top there. And I think that uh, he he is one of the cheapest guys that could be the number one overall tight end. Right? You start going down that list and saying, is it possible? Is it probable? I think it's possible, entirely possible for Kyle Pitts to be the top guy. And he goes off at like six or seven versus taking Laporta at one. And I almost feel like he's dropping off a little bit more too in, in drafts. Like he's slipping just a little bit more each time. Right now, ADP 61 over an underdog, but these are my two favorites. Uh, I put in Mark Andrews, just like, oh, I'll take the easy win, you know, to kind of yeah. see where you go with it. But uh, 100% Mark Andrews and Kyle Pitts are, if I'm going elite this year, that's where I'm going. I've got a little sprinkling of Dalton Kincaid. But I, I struggle to stack him because I don't like taking quarterback early. So uh, these are my two favorite elite tight ends. I yeah. love the possibilities of Pitts. So this week we actually saw Mark Andrews just just sneak ahead of Dalton Kincaid in ADP, and that might when that happens, it often holds. Like mm -hmm. once you know people become kind of slaves to ADP. So once Andrews goes ahead of Kincaid, it could stick like that, and I will have more Kincaid moving forward. But since I've been able to get Andrews after as a tight end five, what are we doing? I mean, like this guy last year, like you you take out the game, he got hurt, and in the game he got hurt, he only played eleven percent of the snaps, right? You take out that game, he averaged, you know, four point six fantasy points per game, which is the tied with Kelsey and Hawkinson as tight end one, right? Uh they didn't go out and add a bunch of weapons. He's easily locked in top two target on the team. He has a top five tight end season of all time on his resume. And I know we're talking best ball, but this was the guy I want to talk about in terms of fab. In redraft, there's an argument to be made that he should be the tight end one in your typical 10 to 12 team league. And that's because one other tight end has a true handcuff that you can pick up and put directly into your lineup if the starter gets hurt. Isaiah likely last year walked right into that role and was getting five, six, seven targets every game. And if you have a league with fab, Right in your typical ten to twelve team league, no one's drafting Isaiah Likely, and if they are drafting him, they're probably going to have to drop him within a couple of weeks. Yeah. When it turns out he's just a backup tight end, so you, you can have Andrews and either put Likely on your bench, or if Andrews gets hurt, drop ninety two dollars on Likely, and it's just you, the position you don't have to worry about it ever. So that's there's an argument to be made that if you go that route and redraft, it's an incredibly safe play with tons of upside. Yeah, I don't think there's any backup tight end that can plug in and give you those kind of results. Uh, okay. Over the last five weeks, likely had four of the five weeks finished as a top eight tight end, including three of them as a top four. So you're just not going to get that kind of replication from the backup. And I, I think it's a, yeah, absolutely. There's so much that just screams Mark Andrews, you know? Mm -hmm. There you go. Uh, yeah, and then, like I said, uh, Kyle Pitts, we've got a, a new quarterback coming there, a new offensive coordinator, new head coach, lots of changes. 
do we get overly excited? Does, does this turn into the Denver of two years ago, like when we brought in Russell Wilson? I freaking hope not, because yeah. that's what Drake London is looking like, uh, as Cortland Sutton did that that first year that he came to town in best ball. Cortland Sutton was going top second round, so I hate taking Drake London right now that early. But that's why we have Kyle Pitts. You can go get exactly that kind of play in the right. tight end position. Love it. Exactly. Uh, so let's go. Let's go late tight end. Uh, more of where we're prone to go. Um, tell me who is your favorite late tight end right now? Yeah. So, uh, again, I got an article coming out on this where you can read all, all about it, but I basically describe the different kind of tight ends you want. The top two target is the, the number one, but again, there's only so many of those guys. Uh, so that's the first thing I look for in a breakout tight end though, is that who could just flat out be a top two target without any help. Right. And there are guys down there, right? Like even, you know, in the mid rounds, you look at like, Pat Fryermuth or or Hunter Henry, what's stopping them from being a top two target on their team? It's entirely possible. And the guy that I've been looking at as of now, that's the farthest down with that possibility is Greg Dulcich, right? You look at what Sean Payton has done historically and what he wants to do is he wants to use uh, what he calls a joker, right? And he calls anybody that can play out of position a joker. So he'll call, he used to call Alvin Kamara a joker because he could line up at wide receiver. He would call Jimmy Graham a joker because he was a tight end that you could put at wide receiver and get those mismatches, right? You could get the corners and, and safeties and, and beat them, right? So that's, that is what Dulcich started out as last year before he got hurt. You know, first two, two, uh, first three drives, he catches two balls, then he gets hurt. And down the stretch, they actually had a different guy play in that role. They, they, uh, they had um, Lucas Kroll, right? Uh, so they had Kroll come in and it was actually running more routes than Adam Trotman. So we, they, we know we want, they want somebody to play that role, whether it's Kroll or Tim Patrick or Greg Dulcich, somebody's going to get that role. And I think now that Jerry Judy's gone, there's no locked in second target, right? We don't know for sure if it's going to be Marvin Mims or, or Troy Franklin or, or, or whoever ends up being Josh Reynolds. Like these names aren't, it's not like they have Jerry Judy and it's not like they have uh, Jerry Judy and Sutton or, or Jamar Chase and T Higgins. There's no clear Mm -hmm. second guy to Sutton. So I think Dulcich could end up getting what's a very valuable role in fantasy football. And he goes up for like tight end 32. Yeah. It's, it's wild how far he's going. You're getting him as your last, maybe second to last pick in, in best ball drafts right now. Uh, I, I think that's kind of the interesting thing. Maybe overall he is the the second pass catcher, but I think there's a good chance those wide receivers even just kill themselves as far as slicing targets. You know, maybe Cortland Sutton starts off hot because, you know, he's the vet. But, you know, Marvin Mims, we can see that, you know, that, that come up from him. We have uh, the rookie Troy Franklin there who, you know, could start eating into it. So at the end of the day, the wide receivers could be next to worthless, you know, as far as just really cutting into themselves. And I love the Dulcich call, uh, especially somebody who can get that late. And we, when it's like, it, when you look at, there's a lot of teams that have these ambiguous groups, right? Where it's like, we don't know, you like, you take all the pass catchers and put them into a bucket and we don't know who's going to get the most targets, right? Like you look at uh, even the 49ers, like take them for instance, like George Kittle got 90 targets, Debo Samuel got 89, right? But one of those guys can slide into a tight end spot, which is so much more valuable in fantasy. That's the difference maker. If I look around and I don't know who's going to get the most targets, out of all this group of pass catchers, but one of them is tight end eligible, that player, even if they all get the same number of targets, that player is more valuable because of that positional eligibility. It's the positional scarcity nature of it that makes me look at these ambiguous groups and say, why not bet on the one that I get a bonus? If they're all equal, this guy's worth more. So I always go that route. Yeah, You mentioned uh, you mentioned Hunter Henry, too. Um, unfortunately, his ADP has creeped up since the draft. Yeah. We were getting him at, like, tight end 21, 22, 23, right mm-hmm. around the draft. So he is coming in at tight end 18. But, uh, un- again, another guy that could easily fit in as the number two pass target as these wide receivers rotate in and out, um, as you yeah, I got said. I a little, little bonus Hunter Henry stat. Uh, guess how many tight end screens the Patriots called last year as a team. Oh God! I forgot they had Johnny Smith. <laughs> uh, Thirty. Zero. Oh, the Patriots last year called zero tight end screens. Zero. The zero. out the new coordinator Alex Van Pelt, right? He's coming in. He called twenty one screens for David and Joku alone, which was the second most of any tight end last year, behind only Evan Ingram. So 
the new play callers coming at zero, right? Like that's crazy, right? The zero that's tight high, especially with those two tight ends they had last year. Yeah, they had. Yeah, it was it, last year was actually Gasecki. It was Gasecki and Hunter. Oh, it was Gasecki. John, Johnny right. Johnny. was four, but yeah, zero. So zero tight end screens. And this year they're bringing a new guy that loves tight end screens. So you get those uh, the typical red zone targets for Hunter Henry that he he, he kind of gets the man to man targets. Now sprinkle a couple more screens on there. Could be nice. All right, so maybe I'm going to go back into the Hunter Henry. I was pulling back a little bit because that price has gone up, so maybe I'll wow. dabble just a little bit more. I've been seeing um, that for sure. I've drafted a lot of him. <laughs> I draft a lot of guys. In that range, it's like Friermuth, Henry. I'll do a little Juwan Johnson because, once again, after Chris Olave, we like Shahid. We, you know, A.T. Perry seems pretty good, but it's not guaranteed, right? We don't know for sure who is going to be second, and, and any time there's uncertainty, we can we can take advantage of that. And he's proven that he can walk away from a season with four to six touchdowns too. So, um, you know, getting that late in the season, I'm I'm all about that. Just because K. Dotton, he doesn't move the needle much for me. Uh, he didn't finish at all in the top eleven a, a single week last year. Right. Uh, Tyler Conklin definitely intrigues me a little bit. Noah Fant in Seattle. Uh, where, where's your? Do you so, have any excitement for him? So I've got so okay. You got the top two target. That's our number one group, right? After that, we look for uh, we look for a few different things. One would be target consolidation, right? So you're looking for, if you can't get a guy that's locked in as the top two targets, how consolidated are the targets at the top? And a great example is uh, George Kittle, is, is he's the unicorn because he's not really a top two target, but he fits every other category we look for. So he's the perfect example, right? So target consolidation, you look at that team, uh, Kyle Juszczyk played almost half the snaps, 44% of the snaps last year, right? And Charlie Warner, the blocking tight end played 29% of the snaps, right? So combine that, and we're talking like that's like a guy playing 70% of the game, right? Over 70% of the game. And those two guys combined for 20 targets. So they're soaking up a huge number of, of, of snaps, but not a huge number of targets. What does that do? Well, when you bring the uh when you bring Kyle Juszczyk in the game, you're not taking out Christian McCaffrey, you're not taking out George Kittle, you're not taking a lineman out. So who comes out? It's the, it's the third wide receiver, right? Wide so receiver. we look for teams that use those fullbacks. The the Dolphins, why are targets so highly consolidated among the Waddle and Tyreek Hill? Because Alec Engold also plays like 40%. Same offense, right? So we look for uh, consolidation in that way. We also look for uh, guys that are uh, one injury away, especially if it's one injury to either guy. So like Kittle, if Debo gets hurt or Ayuk gets hurt, it's a beautiful thing for him, right? Dallas Goddard, if he, he's he's not very exciting, but if either one of the top wide receivers gets hurt, now his value goes up. The problem I run into with Noah Fant is that if, let's say, Tyler Lockett gets, gets hurt, who picks up the extra staffs and the extra targets? Yeah, we got DK and JSN there still. <laughs> right, there's still two. So he's kind of two injuries away. Same problem I run into. But like, like last year, take Dalton Schultz, for instance. Dalton Schultz in games – when everyone was healthy, was getting 4.4 targets per game, which is not a lot. In the games where either Nico or Tank Dell were out, he was getting seven targets a game. That's somebody who had that double handcuff. He was a double handcuff plus because he had standalone value, but if either guy gets hurt, now he has big time upside. Well, now they brought in Stephon Diggs. He's no longer a guy that fits the bill for us, right? So I take Fant, guys like Fant, Komet, Schultz. I'm just not really drafting them because they're too, in, in my in my eyes, multiple injuries away. Whereas there's some other guys out there, uh, you know, Goddard, Otten would fit the bill, right? I, I don't love drafting these guys because they are third yeah. on the team, right? I'd prefer the guys that could just be it outright. But, you know, that's the next best thing, right? That's the next best thing is highly consolidated and the third. Tar- the, diff- the difference is – uh, the difference is for Kate Otten is that the, the Bucks do like using three wide receivers, and there isn't a fullback on the team. And mm-hmm. Coke Keeft, right, the blocking tight end, doesn't really play that much. Like, so we don't even know for sure if, like, Chris Godwin goes down, if it's not going to be Trey Palmer or Jalen McMillan that pick up the slack. Whereas with Kittle, Goddard, some of these guys, we, we, could, we could surmise who it's going to be. 100%. I like that. That's a, that's a great way to looking at that, kind of cleaning up some of those – you know, like you said, the ambiguous receivers or just pass catchers, I guess, trying to figure out where they plug in. Would you be the, the number two, the number three, or the four? Right. If, you know, shit goes down. 
which is interesting for I know you uh you know we kind of talked off air and you had mentioned Johnny Smith as a guy that you kind of like in those later rounds, right? Um, yeah, I I'm I keep bouncing around. Uh ADP plays a lot into it. Not that I mean the the ADP is almost out the window at this point in the draft, but yeah. uh, I'm trying to make sure that I'm grabbing guys later, so I'm not taking the same. You know, my exposure's been outrageous at the end of May just because I did so many drafts. Uh, but John U. Smith, something I'm I'm trying to look back at. Uh, it's been abysmal. The the Dolphins' tight end room ever since uh, McDaniel got there hasn't been fun. But at the same time, I'm mean, I'm expecting a bounce back for Waddle. But if one of these guys goes down. Someone's that's got, it. someone's has to be involved. And th- I think that's my biggest takeaway is I have more faith in Johnny Smith than I would Odell Beckham, who's presumably their number three right now. Uh, they've got a Washington, I believe is the, the rookie they took, but um, the rookie wide receiver, but yeah, I- I'm looking at Johnny Smith. He's not going to do anything. And I'll tell you the, I think Odell wants to be a part-time player at this stage. Mm-hmm. He doesn't want to be out there blocking. So he's fine when they go jumbo sets coming out for the fullback. Right. But I do like the people that, and again, I don't really draft a ton of Kittle myself, but the people that like Kittle should also like Johnny Smith because it's the same offense, right? Mike McDaniel came over and he immediately got the left tackle, Tron Armstead and Alec Engle to play fullback, which is just copying what the 49ers did, right? He just copied Blueprint right there. <laughs> Trent Williams and Kyle Juszczyk, which is smart because it's a great offense. And then they got the two outside guys, you know, you got Debo and Ayuk and you got Waddle and, and Tyreek Hill, and they completely changed Waddle from a slot guy to an outside guy, and he's been he picked it up. Waddle's a great player, a good dynasty ad. But then now you have John who they finally get a guy that can that can come in and hopefully be their every down player. And the only other, and I tweeted this out earlier today, the only tight end besides Kittle over the last five years to have multiple 60 plus yard plays is John Smith. Very athletic player. So it is interesting. There's a lot going on there. And I, I'm, I'm a Patriots fan, but I'll give Dolphins one last shout out on Johnny Smith. Incredible job signing him because he was released by the Falcons. So when they signed him, because he was released and not a free agent, it didn't, it didn't hurt the comp pick for me. So they're still going to get a comp pick back for Christian Wilkins, who's, who left, right? And all these guys and John, who didn't affect that at all. So it's like the best tight end that they could have possibly signed. Because if they had tried to sign away Hunter Henry or, or Dalton Schultz, it probably would have cost them a third round comp pick to do so. So Look at hats that. off. Hats off to the yeah, Dolphins. No kidding. You're not going to find a better fit that, that covered everything they could possibly want. Yeah, a team that's top five in pre-snap motion as well. I think that fits well with what he's able to do, just as his athleticism. And I'm excited to see what McDaniel can kind of plug that in, what we, we miss from Gesicki being down there and – I'm um, drawing a blank on the other tight end because yeah, it's been gross. Dur- Durham Smythe, yeah. And, and I'll tell you, do, do you make a great point with the motion, bringing that up, because they do like using a fullback in, in Alec Ingold, but the other way to, quote, unquote, use a fullback is have Durham Smythe and Johnny Smith out there and then motion Johnny into the backfield. And he can absolutely do that. I've seen this guy take carries out of the backfield. So it's really going to be kind of a a scary and fluid offense. As I say scary because, you know, picture of tom brady right here like i still am a patriots Ugh. fan I'm, I'm an unbiased fantasy and i see it i see it <laughs> i see Peyton it Manning. <laughs> Peyton Manning, great, great great player a great player fantastic probably second best quarterback all time some are saying behind who andrew luck no man, oh, <laughs> i don't have to andrew bust luck. out an episode just on this debate because i get hot and heavy over that <laughs> he's good he's great he's great he's the best honestly it's like you could go into it forever he's the best he's he's the best in so many categories I think he's the best uh, passer of all time, right? I, I think, I think that's where I split it up. Like when I right. when I say goat, I don't necessarily think winning. I winning, you know, yeah, it's handing it off it. or or changing the plays that the, yeah. Like if you were just going to make a list of the best passers of all time, I'm not even sure Brady's top five because he has to be behind Manning. He has to be behind Dan Marino, right? Like probably behind Rodgers too, right? In terms of just pure passing ability. You know, mm-hmm. like there's a lot of guys that are better, just better arm strength, better passing. But it's just in terms of the, playing the position of quarterback and everything that comes with it, including the stuff that happens on Tuesday morning. Right. I think I think nobody was better than Tom Brady. Yeah, I think that's kind of where it almost takes his argument farther is, yeah, you're not top five talent, man, but you yeah. still did what nobody else could do, despite being not as talented as some of these other greats. So. Exactly. Oh, I don't want to give stats, him, the, the, Yeah, again, the problem with stats is that, like, you look at, like, you know, 
if I told you Dak Prescott in the playoff game last year threw for 400 yards and three touchdowns, you'd be like, wow, that guy's got to be great. But he, oh, he, he had the Cowboys, to, so right. But but <laughs> but he he had to do that because of the mistakes he made, right? Mm-hmm. Because of the the interceptions and the and the incompletions on on fourth on third down and, and the fumbles. So the Jameis Winston effect. Right. Like if you're putting up numbers because yeah, exactly. If you're throwing if you're leading the league in touchdown passes because you're leading the league in interceptions, then you know, the the the, the mistakes outweigh it. And that's you know, that's where guys like Rodgers and Brady when you look at some of the seasons they've had, Rodgers had a season where he threw two interceptions and, and was not even playing in the fourth quarter because they were winning so much. It's like, of course, the stats aren't, you know, are insane. But, you know, this is a tight end show, so we don't got to get into that. Absolutely Zombies stupid show. quarterbacks. Get out of here. Get out of here. Get them. They're not important. <laughs> Before we do head out of here, um, we talked about Drake London a little bit. I want to talk about this round two in best ball because you know what? It's got me stumped. I cannot decide where I want to go. And I find myself reaching in the second round. I do not like the early ADPs, uh, but looking at guys like Marvin Harris and Drake London, JT, Saquon Barkley, Chris Olave, Brandon Ayuk, Devontae Adams, Debo, Nico Collins, Mike Evans, Jalen Waddle, and Devon Achan. It's a weird second round. There's so much ceiling, but the floor also seems like it can be lower than in years past. Uh, what's been your approach? Who are your favorite couple out of this yeah. group? So I haven't really been drafting a lot of Marvin Harrison at that ADP. What I did instead is I actually went and looked at what his his over under for yards with like DraftKings and all these sites is a thousand yards. Where some of these other guys are set at like twelve hundred, thirteen hundred, right, fourteen hundred. So I just bet on that, right. And if his ADP comes down, I'll start drafting more of him. But if he has a crazy season, then I'm you know I'm invested that way. I just find that that's an easier way. Like you look at. Those numbers, it just makes more sense for me. The guy I am drafting, I know you said that you are gravitating away from him, is I do take a lot of Drake Long. And I just think that the people that, uh, you know, like Garrett Wilson and they like these other guys because they think the quarterback's going to be better. I mean, if so facto, Drake London's about to have a quarterback that has been one of the better passers, right? Like, forget he doesn't run the ball, which is why we don't put him in the tiers with like, you know, Josh Allen. And, and but he's, his passing stats have been better than Josh Allen. Right, like Drake London's have, uh, and Kirk Cousins has, and Drake London last year was doing things the hard way. I mean, he had 900 yards with Desmond Ritter, and he led the league in contested catches. So they were just chucking it up, and he was going and getting it himself, right? Like creating for himself. If he can do that, and it's just a little easier for him, I don't see why he wouldn't be a a solid pick there. So I go, I honestly go Drake. If I'm picking here, and that's the board, I'm taking Drake London, and if he's gone, I'm taking one of the running backs and I know in best ball people yeah I know in best ball again there's knocks on both of them I take Taylor over Barkley I'm a little worried about the the lack of passing to the running back by Nick Sirianni and the touchdown vulturing by Jalen Hurts but I'd probably take Jonathan Taylor there and if you take those two guys if you take those three guys off the board I think that becomes an interesting discussion who do you let me ask you who do you go with Uh, do you take somebody from that second round ADP or are you reaching down past ADP of 24. I'm not crazy here. When I'm talking yeah. about reach, I'm talking about like half a dozen picks here. Okay, uh, okay. No, I, I think it's just, so I, I guess my early exposure, um, I hit my best ball drafts early as soon as the um, schedule came out and as soon as the NFL draft happened, just, you know, trying to take advantage of those ADP movements. Um, and I, I was all over Drake London um, to the point where I was, you know, upping my exposure a little too much. So I, I have cooled off, but I guess it's also, I feel like he's going to be down at the end of the second round once we get to August. Once we get more casuals in here, I think his ADP will drop, and I think that's when I'm going to attack him again. Uh, just because of the time being, that's all I was going for. So I was trying to find a way to mix it up, and then you also get past those running backs. Uh, just because I don't want all my builds to be hero RB. Like I said, huge running back guy, so I, I do take him from time to time. Uh, but I am found myself, I guess if I'm not taking in that first group that you brought up, uh, Brandon Ayuk and Nico Collins have been two that I've really been looking at. Uh, Tank Dell, I've been smashing in the fourth round, so it's hard to take Nico Collins knowing that I'm probably going to get Dell later on, but I'm not going to do that CJ stack. Uh, but yeah, it's I just think that Marvin and Drake, no matter their ceiling, that, that risk that you're taking in the early second round, it scares the hell out of me to invest that much in you know something that could fall out. Yeah, I worry a little bit about Dell. I'm because he's the thing is, best ball is where I'm definitely taking him. Like, this is the mm-hmm. format for him because he has the explosive big plays. I just worry for redraft that this team, 
you know, when they get to a jumbo situation, right? And again, this is the Bobby Slowick that came over from the 49ers. So they have Andrew Beck, right? Andrew Beck, the fullback, played like 30% of the snaps. We know that Ben Skronik can play some fullback. So we know that they're going to have situations where they are bringing in a jumbo set. I wonder who the two wide receivers are going to be in those sets. Nico Collins is definitely going to be one, right? Because 6'4". Mm-hmm. Uh, and you, Stephon Diggs plays big. Like he's a touchdown right? guy, despite not being the big body. Yeah, so you got to hope that – I mean, the thing is, if, if Diggs or Collins goes down, there's so many outs for Dell that make him a good pick at best ball. Because if either mm-hmm. one of those guys goes down, now he's back to being – You know, if, if they didn't bring Diggs on, where would Dell be? Dell would be going in the second round too. You know what I mean? 100%. Um, so – there's so many outs there. I just do. I, I feel like they did the thing that, you know, that fans do where they overreacted. Tank Dell got hurt on a goal line play, right? And he, like, you know, got rolled up on high ankle sprain, broken leg, or whatever it is. And they said, oh, well, we shouldn't have him out there for those, which is so stupid because it's such a fluky play. He didn't get hurt because he was small. Anyone would have been hurt there, right? I mean, he did not get hurt because he was small. The he dude did is not 160 get pounds. He, he is small, but I think it, <laughs> but it's not like he got a he's not like he got a broken rib or a concussion. 100%. I mean, if 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 a 300 pound dude falls on the back of another 300 pound dude's leg like that, it's probably gonna break his leg. You know what I mean? So I don't yeah. know. I don't know. It's yeah, it's not like he got like stuck in the pile or something, but I think they kind of did do that and say, Hey, if we can have, you know, if we can not have him in that in those situations, it'll be better. And I don't know. I, I was I love Tank Dell. I didn't like the addition personally. I, you know, if, if they if they were if this was Sean McVay's offense and it was three wide receivers every play, you know, in one tight end and no fullback, no blocking tight ends, none of that, then I'd say yeah. But I feel like this scheme, they went out and got a, a they they put one of their wide receivers in a position to not be a full time player, and that might be over invested mm-hmm. in the position. That's all. They're supporting a quarterback, so you can't blame them there, at least, right? right? right. <laughs> That's with, all like the, with all the injuries, you know, having three wide receivers is is huge. That's how when the Rams won the Super Bowl, they lost Robert Woods, and thank God mm-hmm. they had just went out and got Odell Beckham, right, to go with mm-hmm. the Cup. So it's like you kind of need that. There's a lot of teams if they lose their top wide receiver, the season's pretty much over. Like what happens if yeah. the Rams lose Amon Ross? I was saying, what happens if the if the Lions lose Amon Ross St. Brown? They're done. <laughs> they're, they're, who who is their second best wide receiver if that happens? Khalif Raymond, Jamison Williams. No, Jamison Williams becomes the first best player without Amon. Oh, Sibre. okay, I got you. That's a so yeah, James, um, he's like so, so at that point. Uh, it might be Khalif Raymond. So it is pretty scary. Like you know, they maybe they should on, go get T Higgins. I tweeted that people got very upset. Oh really? <laughs> I mean, hit me with the hate, sides. folks. I love it. <laughs> they love it. The 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 Bengals fans are saying it's not happening. The Lions fans are saying it's spending too much. And I'm sitting here. I'm saying you'd have the most complete offense in the league. You'd have T Higgins at split end and Almond Rossi Brown at slot flanker and Jamison Williams as field stretcher and and Laporte at tight end and two good running backs. I'm like, what? I I was shocked that people weren't like, yeah, that would be perfect. And everyone was like, no, 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 no. Everyone's got too much. They got fantasy brains. They're like, I drafted Amon Ross St. Brown in the first round of my recent draft, so I don't want that. I took I took Sam Ward as tight end one, so I don't want that. It's, it's not about what you want. It's about what's best for this football team. Right. It's like we've never seen quarterbacks support multiple top options. It's like Chris Chris or Kirk Cousins didn't have uh, Adam Thielen and Stephon Diggs in the top twelve. You know, like come on, folks. We, we've seen this done before. Uh, hey, Big 2000, had th- two thousand thirteen. Peyton Manning supported four. He threw, I mean, he threw 55 touchdown passes, which is the record, but still. Big Ben had three top 25 wide receivers. Like, it's we've, we've seen it done before, you know, and that was just Tyler a few Bob. years ago. Yep. Um, oh, man. Coop, I can't thank you enough for being here. Um, uh, got to wrap it up here. we got to get you on your way. I can't, uh, like I said, thank you so much for coming on, dropping all of this tight end knowledge on you. Uh, before we go, let everybody know what you're working on, where can they find you? First, the only reason I came on to do this is because I want to be on the movie podcast. So I was like, maybe if I get my foot in the door with this football stuff, I can get on and talk a little movies with the gang. So uh, that's what fingers crossed. That's 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 the I I, I revealed my secret plan. Uh, but yeah, people can find me uh, follow me on Twitter here at Coop A Fiasco. Everything I write that's free, I tweet it, I post it on Reddit. It's free, so that's the whole point. And if you like the stuff that's free then go pick up a copy of our best ball cheat sheet. It has all my rankings, 
right? Like all the tight ends. Anyone that wants my like everything I'm I'm thinking about tight ends, you can just go get that right now with the best ball cheat sheet. Or we have our draft guide for redraft coming out at the end of the month. Or if you get an all pro membership, you get everything. Uh, that's the easiest way. Free stuff's always posted. I'm doing an article again. So, uh, and then if you if you like what you hear, what you see, all my rankings are right there for the taking. So but thank you for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Like I said, I can't thank you enough. Uh, if you're looking for a little bit for, more from me because, you know, uh, you just Coop ran out of stuff to give you. I've got a little bit there. Uh, the Too Much Best Ball, we're dropping shows every day, going live on Tuesdays at 1130. Uh, too Much Fantasy Football, of course, we've got all the fun redraft talk there. And then if, you know, I'm talking too much football, you want a little bit of a, a relief. I've got Too Much Movie Night and Too Much Shenanigans for all your comedy and movie needs. But uh, until then, we'll see you all next time. Thanks for, thanks for joining us. Thank <laughs> you.